Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 415. Today we're taking on a bit of the conventional wisdom, which holds that, yes, yes, in retrospect, we may be able to say that the war in Iraq was a mistake, but surely no one can dispute that the surge worked. Well, what was the surge, and what exactly do we mean by worked? That's what we're going to talk to Ray McGovern about today. Ray McGovern is a retired CIA officer. He was a CIA analyst from 1963 to 1990. In the 1980s, he chaired national intelligence estimates and prepared the president's daily brief. He was responsible for the analysis of Soviet policy in Vietnam, and he received the Intelligence Commendation Medal at his retirement, but he returned it in 2006 in protest at the CIA's involvement in torture. In 2003, he co-founded Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, and this group issued a letter before the 2003 invasion of Iraq stating that intelligence analysts were not being listened to by policymakers. So a very important figure, Ray McGovern, and I can think of no one better to join us to talk about this topic. Ray, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. I have read your stuff and listened to interviews with you for years and years now, and I finally decided to invite you on because I saw your article over the Memorial Day weekend. How to Honor Memorial Day was the title it was given on antiwar.com. We will link to that on today's show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 415. And you begin very bluntly in traditional Ray McGovern style. How best to show respect for the U.S. troops killed in Iraq and Afghanistan and for their families on Memorial Day? Simple. Avoid euphemisms like the fallen and expose the lies about what a great idea it was to start those wars and then to surge tens of thousands of more troops into those fool's errands. Well, (laughs) no boring introductions for you uh, for articles like this. That paragraph alone gives me a lot of things I want to ask you about, and I'd like to go out of chronological order and ask you, because it's been in the news, about the surge Uh, from years ago in the Iraq war, because there's been some discussion in recent days when Jeb Bush was asked whether he favored the Iraq war, that came back up, and then Rand Paul weighed in, and he was against the war, but he said the surge worked, and that seems to be the conventional wisdom, whether you favored the war or you didn't, the surge worked. Can you tell us what was the surge, and did it quote-unquote work? Well, you have to go back uh, nine years now uh, to the spring and summer of 2006, Things were going very badly. Uh, It was a very, very harsh year for the war on both sides. And finally, uh, after three years, we're talking from 2003 to 2006, after the invasion by the U.S., U.K., and and other places and other other countries, uh, three so three years of experience. And the generals on the scene, namely General Casey, who's now uh, Army Chief of Staff and uh, General Abizade, who is head of the so-called CENTCOM, which is the Central Command, having purview over that whole area, had said, look, our strategy is not working. Uh, As soon as we send new troops in, the Shia government that we're supporting um, persecutes the Sunni, uh, marginalizes them, and the, uh, the... reconciliation that is necessary, at least the modus vivendi between Shia and Sunni, is made even less possible. And so they came back in the summer of 2006, testified before the, uh, uh, before the Senate Armed Forces Committee, and um, actually laid it all out. Uh, I have a quote from, uh, from General Abizade, who again was the uh, head of CENTCOM, in his testimony in November uh, of 2006, uh, to his answer to uh, uh, John McCain, um, when John McCain said, well, don't we need to surge? Don't we need to put more? This is uh, General Abizade, again, head of the whole campaign out there. This is his answer. McCain's pressing vigorously for sending 20,000 at that time. We ended up sending 30,000. Here it is. Uh, I'll be saved. Senator McCain, I met with every divisional commander, with General Casey, with the Corps commander, General Dempsey. We all talked together, and I said, in your professional opinion, 
if we were to bring in more American troops now, does it add considerably to our ability to achieve success in Iraq? And they all said, no. And the reason is because we want the Iraqis to do more. It is easy for the Iraqis to rely upon us to do this work. I believe that more American forces prevent the Iraqis from doing more, from taking more responsibility for their own future, period, end quote. What am I saying here? I'm saying that the military leaders responsible for the area were saying, please, whatever you do, don't send any more U.S. troops. And this testimony was be before the Senate Armed Forces Committee on November 15, 2006. What happened next? Well, next, the ambassador out there, Khalid Zad, sent in a cable, a classified cable to Washington, and he said, quote, proposals to send more U.S. More US forces to Iraq would not produce a long-term solution and would make our policy less, not more sustainable. Okay, what else? Well, during the same time, a very uh, establishment-heavy Iraq review group had convened, led by James Baker, who was uh, Secretary of State for the first George Bush, and uh, they led off their, their report by saying the situation in Iraq is grave and deteriorating the U.S. must begin to move its combat forces out of Iraq responsibly. By the first quarter of 2008, all combat brigades not necessary for force protection should be out of Iraq. End quote. This is the so-called Baker-Hamilton Report, the Iraq Review Group, on which I would add Robert Gates uh, was a member. Okay. Now, what happens next? Well, <laughs> the next is is almost unbelievable. Um, Donald Rumsfeld, who, like, like Robert McNamara before him with respect to Vietnam, um, is getting wobbly on a war based largely on Rumsfeld's own misguided advice. Now, how do I know that? Well, we have a message that Rumsfeld sent to President Bush on November 6, 2006, in which he says, clearly U.S. forces are currently doing in Iraq are not working well or fast enough. We got to get out with a, with a regular small withdrawal first, and then we have to get the Iraqis, quote, to know that they have to pull up their socks, step up and take responsibility for their country, end quote. Now, that was the day before the midterm elections. It was really awkward. Because just two weeks before, Bush had said, Rumsfeld is golden, we're going to keep him on forever, okay, for the next two years. Well, what was, what was, what was Bush and what were Cheney going to do? Well, obviously, this was bad news for them. It looked like they might have to lose <clears throat> a war on their watch. So they went to the American Enterprise Institute, where Frederick Kagan, uh, a neocon sort of strategist, and uh, General uh, Jack Keane, <clears throat> who was a neocon general, had been vice chief of staff of the army. And uh, Bush and Cheney said, well, you know, what happens if we follow all these recommendations from Rumsfeld, from our generals, <laughs> from the Iraq study group? And they say, well, Mr. President, we're sorry to tell you, but then you will lose a war on your watch. And he said, well, how can we prevent this? And Kagan and Keene and the others said, well, it's very simple, Mr. President. Uh, you could send in, let's call it a surge. You could surge 30,000 troops in there, and they could, uh, they could create peace by some ethnic cleansing and some other measures there in and around Baghdad, and that would give you enough breathing space so that the things would quiet down simply because of the carnage, simply because of the fatigue, simply because we had se separated Shia from Sunni. And it would take another two years for it to get bad. And meanwhile, you could uh, ride off into the western sunset not having lost the war. Now, Bush and Cheney said, wow, okay, well, let, let's see how we do this. <laughs> They couldn't use Rumsfeld, could they? They had to fire him. And they needed a new Secretary of Defense. 
Uh, they couldn't use Casey or Abhi's aid, the highest generals. Uh, they were wobbly. Uh, wobbly is another word for uh, for realistic here. Oh, but there's this there's this medal bedecked with not only battle medals, but I think every uh, merit badge that he won as a as a scout. Uh, David Petraeus, he, he's on he's on board with the surge. He's been talking to Jack Keane and Fred Kagan. Yeah, he'll do whatever's needed. But we still need a secretary of defense. And so little Bush went to Big Bush and he said, what are we going to do? And Big Bush said, oh, I know just the guy. His name is Bob Gates. He'll do it. If you make him secretary of state, I guarantee he'll do it. So on the 5th of October, Gates meets in Crawford with President Bush. And President Bush lays it all out. He says, you know, it's getting really hairy over there, and our, our generals are going wobbly. Um, we, but Petraeus here uh, is willing to do the, the work from the military side, but we need a secretary of defense, and we need somebody to push this surge to get rid of the generals that are there now. And so, uh, so would you do it? And I know Gates. I've known him for 45 years. He worked for me when I was head of the Soviet foreign policy branch in, in, uh, at the agent at, at CIA in the early 70s. So I, you know, it was not a surprise to me what Gates says, well, you, you, you mean, Mr. President, that that would be like, you know, like, like I'd, be, I'd be Secretary of Defense? <laughs> and Bush said, yeah, that's the deal. All you have to do is go out there to Iraq, uh, tell Casey he's retired, or tell him to come back and we'll make him chief of staff. Um, tell Abhi say, you know, he needs to retire, and Petraeus will do all the rest of the work. And Gates says, I'm in. I'm in. Okay? That's the story. And we know the results. What happened was, first off, most important in my view, a thousand, actually more than a thousand U.S. troops perished in that surge. What did the surge accomplish? Well, ethnic cleansing is the easiest way to describe it, uh, it transformed uh, a predominantly Sunni city called Baghdad into a predominantly Shia city, also called Baghdad. There were people at the University of California, Los Angeles, who had a satellite program, and they watched, they watched the lights go out in the, in the Sunni neighborhoods. So what happened was, the 30,000 U.S. troops uh, formed a kind of cordon sanitaire around Baghdad, and the Shia militia were let into the city to do their, their dirty work. Uh, it was at this time, in July 2007, that Bradley Manning, now Chelsea Manning, observed what was going on on the ground. Okay, he was there. He was seeing what was happening behind U.S. troops, Iraqi troops throwing young kids into prison for writing critical term papers about Maliki. And so when he saw uh, that terrible uh, WikiLeaks released um, helicopter gunship shooting up Iraqi civilians, uh, that was when he decided he needed to tell the world what was going on. So that, that too, in a curious way, was a direct result of the brutality of the surge. And, and I'm not speaking only of uh, brutalizing Iraqis. If you just listen, you just listen to the conversation of those helicopter, those young fellows in the helicopter gunship, it's brutal. And that's one of the prices we pay. We brutalize our own soldiers when we send them into missions like this. And when they come home, well, well you know what often happens. So what was the effect of the surge? Well, aside from killing a thousand U.S. troops, aside from killing tens of thousands of Iraqis, uh, the... Uh, the place sort of calmed down a little bit, and Bush and Cheney were able to leave two years later without having lost the war. So from their point of view, the surge was an amazing success. From the point of view of Iraq, well, I rest my case by just saying, look at it now. Look at it now. Chaos. Uh, a far more dangerous breeding place for uh, terrorism than ever existed before the invasion of Iraq. And last but not least, what's the solution being proposed by the American <laughs> Enterprise Institute? Guess what? A new surge. And guess who's promoting it? 
General Kane, <laughs> Fred Kagan, and all the rest of those neocons who, who uh, have never, well, who, who want to, uh, uh, to make sure that uh, they're, they're not totally discredited by giving it, no, and golf would call it a mulligan. They're, they're, they're trying to get a mulligan. Now, last thing I'll say on this right now is what about Obama? Well, <laughs> you know, Obama is incredibly naive, even today. During the campaign, you may recall that after calling a spade a spade, his first campaign I'm talking about, and saying the surge was, was not a good idea, he finally relented and listened to advisors like John Brennan, now head of the CIA, and he said, quote, the surge the surge was a victory beyond all our expectations, period. And quote, God, you know, now he's hoisted on his own petard. Is he going to not do a surge and not live up to the expectations of the neocons? Or is he finally going to act like an adult male and say, look, it was a fool's errand before. We wasted a thousand U.S. lives. I'm not going to waste any more. I'm going to tell them, look. You get your act together there in Baghdad and don't expect any help from us if you don't work out arrangements where you can power share between Shia and Sunni. That's what has to happen. And uh, if Obama steps up this time, well, I'll be belatedly glad and also surprised if he, if he acquiesces in this drive by McCain and Lindsey Nelson and, and these guys at the American Enterprise Institute, I will not be surprised. But I'd be really, really angered. Well, I have to say one thing that was a pleasant surprise for me was that he he persisted in the Iranian negotiations, even with the neocons howling and screaming, which was something, right? I mean, it, that's at least something he can point to after eight years. And I say that not as a, a supporter of his. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Well, I would agree with one caveat. The deal is not done. Well, that's true. They have the till the end of uh, June, I believe, and uh, there is all manner of possibilities for Israel, for its supporters, or people who, uh, who have a, a animus against Iran in this country to to put the kibosh on it. But your general point, I agree with completely. And Iran, in many respects, is a different story. And and I have to tell you that uh, after. My own former colleagues, and I'm not talking about the operatives, uh, you know, people who ran the black prisons and kidnapped people and tortured them. That, that was the operation. I'm talking about my own fellow analysts who allowed themselves to be corrupted, to be prostituted in, in manufacturing evidence, in quotes, to justify, in quotes, war on Iraq. When I saw that happen... And please, uh, please, for your listeners, uh, the war on Iraq was not based on mistaken intelligence. It wasn't a mistake. It was out and out fraud. And I'm really embarrassed to admit that my former colleagues cooperated fully in ordering up forgeries, all kinds of weird stories with which they sold the war. So it was a mis not a mistaken war. It was a it was a. Uh, and how it now fraud on the American people <clears throat> and, of course, on the Iraqi people. The reason I mention that is because I was just about to say, well, you know, you ought, to, you ought to destroy, you ought to dismantle the CIA. It's not performing any useful function anymore when the analysts themselves do not tell the truth anymore. And then guess what happened? Somebody had the presence of mind to say, hey, uh-oh, uh, Bush and Cheney have their sights on Iran now, not Iraq, Iran. And uh, what we do. And so somebody said, well, let's get somebody honest in to run a national intelligence estimate. This is the, the creme de la creme, the, the supreme genre of intelligence analysis. A national intelligence estimate on Iran. See how close they are to getting a nuclear weapon, which was, of course, the big issue. They couldn't find anybody. <laughs> they went to the State Department to the head of State Department's uh, Intelligence and Research Group, uh, Assistant Secretary Thomas Finger, and they said, Tom, you are good on Iraq. You, you, 
you compose all kinds of footnotes to those erroneous judgments. Why don't you come in and do one now on Iran? And Finger said, are you kidding? No, <laughs> no way. That was, that was a debacle. I, and they said, no, no, Tom, you have to do it. You have to do it because, well, because you have the experience and you have the, the reputation for honesty. Please come in and do it. And Finger said, if I can bring a couple of my specialists from the State Department, I'll do it. But I don't need any interference while I'm doing it. Long story short, throughout 2007, they did a bottom-up assessment, discarding all the guesses that had been made in the past about Iran seeking a nuclear weapon. And in November of 2007, right after Bush had disgraced himself by saying, the Iran is on the verge of getting a nuclear weapon. It's going to be it's going to be terrible, and they're they're just about to get one. And one journalist asked, "Well, Mr. President, um, well, how do you how do you know that?" He said, "What do you want? World War Three? Is that what you want? World War Three? Come on, you know." So, two weeks after that, this national intelligence estimate came out, and it said, and I quote: "We we judge or we assess." with uh, high confidence that Iran stopped working on a nuclear weapon at the end of 2003, at the end of 2003, and has not resumed work on a nuclear weapon. Now, that was a judgment made in November 2007. It was unanimous. That means all 16 U.S. intelligence agencies. And as I just mentioned, it was based on high confidence judgment. Well, what happened? <laughs> well, that, that estimate was given to Congress. And so this gave Admiral Mike Mullen a really good chance to see that he wouldn't be ordered uh, to make a war on Iran. What he did was he went to the, to the White House and he said, now, Mr. Bu uh, President Bush, this is really serious stuff because it's going to leak. It's got to leak. It, the Congress has it going to leak. So I think what we need to do is put out a sanitized version of the key judgments, uh, and, and we can put our own spin on it. <laughs> pretty, pretty disingenuous of, 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 of Mullen to say spin. How are you going to spin a reversal, a 180-degree reversal, from a judge, judgment that Iran is just about to get a nuclear weapon to a judgment that it stopped? working on it a couple four years ago. Well, anyhow, it worked. <laughs> and Bush said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So in November, they put out a sanitized version, which was reasonably accurate, and that put the kibosh on Bush and Cheney's wish and plan and intention to attack Iran with or without Israel the following year, their last year in office, 2008. Now, People, your, your listeners might be saying, well, how can McGovern say that? <laughs> well, McGovern can refer you to Decision Points, uh, the uh, memoir of George W. Bush. And he must have written this, this part himself, because what he says is, this estimate was an eye-popping surprise. It deprived me of the military option. And then this quote, quote, for how could I order... U.S. forces to attack the nuclear facilities of a country that the intelligence community said had no active nuclear weapons program, end quote. Best rhetorical question he ever asked. But yeah. Well, the, the, <laughs> the thing that he you know, said, well, bummer, you know, a bummer. No more war in Iran. Or, you know, if you were really interested or really concerned, as the Israelis really were, that Iran might be getting a nuclear weapon. Well, why didn't he just say, hey, call up, call up Israel here. We got some great news. Yeah, exactly. We're thrilled to hear this. <laughs> so that's how corrupt everything was. But what I'm saying here is that when I, whereas I was prepared to throw the baby out with the bathwater after the debacle on intelligence performance, the fraud on before Iraq, I was reassured that there's still enough honest intelligence analysts there at CIA. You know, how, but how, how do you account for that? How do you uh, explain the difference? Well, the difference really was Tom Finger. In other words, he was a guy, he'd been around the intelligence community for 30 years, um, PhD, Stanford, uh, incredible knowledge and experience, most recently, very woeful experience 
uh, with the estimate on Iraq, which was fraud, okay? And uh, he knew his way around, and he stuck his neck out. Uh, he did get the, the chance to bring in some of his own experts, and then he was, he was adroit enough uh, to work underneath the limelight. Congress was pushing for this estimate all throughout 2007. <laughs> so was I, you know? We knew it was being composed. I didn't have the, the foggiest notion that Finger was running this clandestine operation, really, where the analysts had been sworn to secrecy and where he got the whole intelligence community, mind you, okay? The whole intelligence community, all 16 agencies, including those of the Pentagon, everywhere else, behind this judgment. And it did. And I just say this, that, you know, been around uh, U.S. intelligence estimates now for a half century, never before and never since have I been able to say that one national intelligence estimate uh, honestly performed plays a huge role in preventing a disastrous war. You, you think Iraq was bad? War in Iran would have made uh, Iraq look like a, like a volleyball game between Mount St. Ursula and St. Helena's Academy, all right? It would have been really, really tough. Mullen knew that. Everyone knew that. Uh, the Admiral, what was his name? Uh, Admiral Fallon <laughs> had said publicly two years before, we're not going to do Iran on my watch. And what happened to him? He was cashiered. He was, he was retired. So there was a lot of guts on the part of the analysts themselves, but analysts need thoughtful, courageous leadership. Tom Finger was a fellow from the State Department who came in and provided that leadership and in large measure saved us from a terribly disastrous war on Iran. Well, Ray, I wanted to talk to you also about Afghanistan and also your career in the CIA, but I hope I can actually invite you back in the future. We'll do a whole separate episode on that. I'm glad we got all the information out on the surge. It's hard to get anything reliable on the surge from the media because it's all the same song and dance constantly about the surge. You certainly can't get it from the politicians, but I know we could get it from Ray McGovern. But I would like to have you back to talk about the Afghanistan question because there you do have people who say, well— we had to go in and get bin Laden so I can at least look the other way there, and I would love to get your take on that. But for now, I just want to say thank you for not only for your time today, but also for being such a uh, an outspoken and uh, truth teller when it's often such a thankless and depressing job. Thanks so much. You're most welcome, Tom. All right, everybody, that's today's episode. Remember, the show notes page is tomwoods.com slash 415, and on that page, we're going to have an article actually a very recent article, as a matter of fact, by Ray McGovern on the general subject of the surge. So do please make use of the show notes pages, this one being tomwoods.com slash 415. And as a personal favor to me, if you have not yet checked out my new book, please take a look at it. It's super cheap. The Kindle edition is like four bucks, and it's a gazillion pages of fun reading of me taking on the bad guys. I think you'll enjoy it. It's called Real Dissent, A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. I have a whole site set up for it. It's realdissent.com. And remember, you can get the audiobook version with me reading it for free if you haven't yet gotten your free book through the offer that's available through tomwoodsaudio.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show. 